Uh, thank you to Tour Imagination for planning these virtual tours. We're thrilled to pieces to be, to be able to bring Kaufman Museum to a wider audience. Kaufman Museum tells the story of Mennonites coming to the Central Plains of the United States and Canada in the 1870s and the prairie landscape that they encountered, the Native Americans that were forcibly removed just prior to the Mennonites' arrival, and cultures where the Mennonites went in missions after they were well settled. But today we want to talk about movement, movement of individuals, families, congregations, moving from country to country and what kinds of things from continent to continent, what kinds of things they decided to bring along. Most specifically, what kinds of furniture did they decide to bring along? We'll hear from Reinheld Cowenhoven Jansen, the original curator of the Mennonite furniture collection here at Kaufman Museum. We'll hear about a specific artifact that the museum holds, the historic cabinet organ, and how it moved, how it moved across Europe, across an ocean, and then across the United States, Ohio to Kansas, eventually finding its home here in North Newton, Kansas. And last, we'll hear about exhibits from Kaufman Museum that move, again, move across the continent, Canada, the United States, and these are exhibits uh, curated and fabricated by Kaufman Museum staff made to be moved to sites like museums, libraries, archives, and churches. First off, we'll start again with that Mennonite furniture collection, and I'd like to welcome Reinheld Cowenhoven Jansen. So we are in the um, exhibition of uh, Mennonite furniture from the Vistra Delta in southern uh, Russia region. I'm starting you all off um, with this big, somewhat simplified map, but you can see that, um, let's focus on Europe, and you see the big yellow dot that is at the Baltic Sea, that is the Vistra Delta region in what is now Poland, and was Poland in the 16th century, when Mennonites migrated from the Netherlands where they had lived uh, for a long time. Uh, Mennonites from the Netherlands moved <coughs> to the Vistula Delta for religious freedom. Uh, essentially, um, the Polish king had invited them to settle there. They had been persecuted in the Netherlands. Um, so they then settled in the late 16th century in the Vistula Delta in Poland. And in the uh, later part uh, of the 18th century, they moved on the invitation of Catherine the Great to the Ukraine uh, or to southern uh, Russia, uh, where they uh, were allowed to settle and have, have land and have their own schools. Uh, some of them, the other in the middle, <laughs> There in the south of Poland, others uh, migrated um, there from, um, from Switzerland and also from the, from the Netherlands. And then you can uh, see um, the sweep of migrations that happened in the late 19th century um, from what was then Prussia and the, from southern Russia um, in the, and with all of these dots, they migrated to the plain states of uh, North America um, into, uh, all the way up into Manitoba um, and brought their belongings with them. So everything in this exhibition um, was uh, brought along from those uh, regions and then also some of it built here. We are here in front of the oldest uh, dowry chest in our collection. It was made by fine craftsmen in the region out of ash um, veneer and then with dark, uh, darker inlay uh, in a very ornate uh, pattern. Uh, the dowry chests had uh, always could be locked because they um, harbored or they contained uh, the family 
um, Dao ways, that is bed linens and linens. And if uh, you can take a good look at the, uh, also the beautiful interior, uh, the uh, key plate is very ornate and <coughs> the uh, tinned ironwork and the hinges uh, are very ornate in a style that would date the chest back to the late 18th century. Um, so around 1790 or, or earlier. Uh, and then <clears throat> one reason for the, for the key is that this small <coughs> compartment inside the chest would hold money <laughs> and would hold maybe jewelry. So this is a very beautiful, let's say high-end piece of furniture that well-to-do Mennonites could afford. Um, the, when you could not afford hardwood furniture like this, then you would get a chest made out of softwood and paint it. In 1882, a Mennonite uh, family in the what we call the Molochna colony, one of the early colonies in um, South Russia, gave this chest to their daughter. Now this chest, in contrast to the one we just saw, is made from soft pine and then it is very delicately painted to simulate the light color of, of ash veneer or of hardwood veneer and the decoration corresponds in style to the one that we saw on the other uh, earlier uh, chest um, to simulate inlay, but it is all um, painted. So we are looking at another uh, painted chest, uh, but here I just want to point out how uh, women often pasted uh, keepsakes or you know pictures that intrigued them or that they felt very sentimental about sentimental about. We are standing here in front of the oldest um, wardrobe brought by a Mennonite family from the Vistra Delta uh, to this uh, country. Um, this style that we see in this wardrobe is typical of uh, early and mid-19th century European furniture styles. So the Mennonites embraced the culture around them. They had lived in this area for hundreds of years. Now the, here we have um, a wardrobe that is somewhat smaller in scale than the one we just looked at. This, this was actually built by a Mennonite uh, craftsman. There were many uh, Mennonite craftsmen, cabinet makers, who continued building furniture once they had settled here in Kansas. So this was a wardrobe made by a Mennonite uh, craftsman in Kansas in 18, around 1885, five, ten years after they migrated here. This particular wardrobe, also made of pine and then with simulated um, very dramatic uh, graining, was also made by a Mennonite craftsman who immigrated from southern Russia, from the Molochna colony to Kansas. This was made around 1885. What we can see here is that is made up of component parts, of 13 se uh, separate uh, parts that is, uh, then get assembled. This would facilitate moving this large piece into a rather more modest uh, home. Thanks to very astute uh, Mennonite collectors, uh, such as Ethel Abrahams, who assisted me with the research for this um, collection and interpretation. She collected the tools that Mennonite craftsmen used um, for their um, painted uh, furniture. And then we also uh, wanted to highlight the great skill in joinery that cabinets uh, display and also the uh, other furniture in this exhibition. 
So um, all of these wooden <laughs> blocks that you see here actually are the different kinds of joints that the cabinet makers mastered. The uh, Mennonite uh, cabinet maker Franz Adrian emigrated from southern Russian Russia to Kansas with his family in the late 19th century. Uh, the, all of these pieces that you see here, the wardrobe, the door, the chimney cabinet, the corner cabinet, um, were made uh, by him for his family home. He, paint, he made this wardrobe in one piece in contrast to the wardrobes that were, a so few wardrobes that were brought from the Vistula Delta that could be disassembled and reassembled. Um, this cabinet maker's daughter um, is said to have painted the lovely floral ornaments uh, on his cabinets, on his, this particular wardrobe uh, on the door. I'm David Kreider, Technician and Collections Coordinator here at Koff Museum, and I'm delighted to introduce you to our historic cabinet organ. The Tess Schumacher deck novel Van der Smissen Organ. It gets its long name from the name of the builder, the original owner, and his family descendants. The organ's odyssey can be traced across 270 years of travel from Germany to Holland, back to Germany, to Ohio, and then finally on to Kansas. I'd like to tell you a brief history of this organ's odyssey. In 1750, the German organ builder Jakob Teschemacher completed this six-stop cabinet organ for Johannes Decknadel, who was a Mennonite minister in Amsterdam, and it was built to be used in Decknadel's home, not the church. Organs were introduced into the Dutch churches about 15 years later, in the late 1700s. In 1796, this organ was shipped to Hamburg when Decknadel's daughter Hilleganda married a, a prominent merchant, Jakob van der Smissen. The organ continued moving in Europe with the van der Smissen family, several generations of whom were Mennonite ministers. The organ traveled between Hamburg, Danzig, and Friedrichstadt, where in 1850, during the, the Danish Holstein War, it was damaged by occupying troops. In 1868, Pastor Carl Eustace von der Smissen brought the organ with him to Ohio when he became the headmaster of the first Mennonite institution of higher learning in Wadsworth, the Wadsworth Institute, where it was thought to have been played during services there. In 1900, the organ came to Kansas when Carl's daughter Wilhelmina was invited to supervise a deaconess hospital in Gossel. She then, with her brother Carl, donated this instrument to Bethel College in 1910. Coffee Museum has been the organ's caretaker since 1940, and we're privileged to have the only Teschemager organ outside of Europe, and to be able to preserve this important artifact, which illustrates a Mennonite family's migration story. The instrument's last major journey was in 2007, when we disassembled the organ, packed it, and drove it to the NOAC Organ Company in Massachusetts. There it received an extensive, historically accurate renovation, bringing the instrument back to its 1750 playing condition. We now display the organ in, prominently in our auditorium and use it for recitals. And now via the capable hands of Karen Baumann Schlebaugh, retired professor of music at Bethel College. Let's listen to the voice of the historic Teschemacher Decknadel Van der Smissen organ.
My name is Chuck Regeer, curator of exhibits at Kaufman Museum. Kaufman Museum is located in a sparsely populated area. By, by designing exhibits to travel, our collection and the stories they tell can be shared with a much larger audience. Traveling exhibits allow us to leverage a larger revenue stream than would be possible for the traditional temporary installation. In 1990, Kaufman Museum opened the Mirror of the Martyrs exhibit, inspired by the rediscovery and purchase of 23 copper etchings used to print the 1685 edition of the Martyr's Mirror. When raising funds to purchase these rare works of art, the decision was made to also fund the development of a mobile exhibit to pre present this story across North America. Our desire was to create a high quality exhibit that was dramatic and visually compelling, but that would also be cost effective to transport, quick to install and easy to pack. The, dis the display panels are connected to an aluminum uh, structure with Velcro making them easy to reconfigure, take off and reconfigure in different locations, but also to house the electrical wiring necessary uh, for the exhibit lighting. We chose to add lighting to the exhibit because we knew that in many venues there would not be track lighting and other museum amenities. Rather than building crates and paying to ship the exhibit, we purchased a used 15-foot moving van outfitted to safely pack the exhibit components. With a museum staff member and a team of dedicated volunteers, the exhibit was driven from venue to venue, offered for a modest fee. During its first 10 years on the road, Mirror of the Martyrs was installed at more than 60 venues across the US and Canada, at colleges, churches, art galleries, libraries, and other venues, including an Amish barn and a machine shed. Some of you may have seen the exhibit at one of these locations. An addition to our building in 2004 created a home base for the Mirror of the Martyrs, and this continues to be a valuable resource, using these stories from the past to ask probing and relevant questions for today. The exhibit is available for booking. Following the production of the Mirror of the Martyrs, Kaufman Museum continued to develop traveling exhibits, refining our craft, expanding into this niche museum market. Some of these exhibits were created at the invitation of collectors to feature their treasures, while others were designed and produced on contract for other organizations. Realizing that a dedicated truck is not practical for all exhibits, we explored ways in which the exhibit display components could also function as shipping crates. The When Disaster, when Disaster Strikes exhibit was produced for Mennonite Disaster Service to commemorate their 50th anniversary. Each crate contains all elements for one exhibit module and could be set up in a few minutes. This concept was used to create an exhibit telling the story of the American bison, which Kauf Museum tours on behalf of the National Buffalo Foundation. In 2014, Kauf Museum was approached by a local thrift store with items that had been held back from sale due, con due to concerns over racist imagery or content. We developed an exhibit using these items to promote community conversations around issues of stereotyping and racism. The Sorting Out Race exhibit used these crates that turn inside out to become display cases. Designed to look like a storefront, the exhibit is entered uh, as though opening the door to a local thrift stop shop. The crate display cases represent the exhibit themes and ask questions and invite deeper reflection. Some of you may have seen this exhibit at one of its 11 installations possibly at the California State University in Fresno, the Depot MCC Thrift Shop in Goshen, or Rainbow Mennonite Church in Kansas City. Sorting Out Race received a Leadership in History Award from the American Association of State and Local History. With the approach of the 100th anniversary of World War I, our museum term team worked with historian James Yonke to tell the story of conscientious objectors and resistance to that war. The Voices of Conscience exhibit is built around a reconstruction of a prison cell 
where Hutterite brothers Jacob and Joseph Hofer were held and tortured at Alcatraz Prison, later dying at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. Using stories of courage and nonviolent resistance from the past, Voices of Conscience raises issues relevant for today and was also recognized with a national award. This too is an exhibit some of you may have already seen, with 19 installations to date, as far north as Winnipeg and Steinbach, at Anabaptist colleges and universities, including Elizabethtown, CMU, Goshen, Bluffton, and EMU. Host communities have used Voices of Conscience to highlight their own stories of conscience, providing a catalyst for local dialogue. Both of these exhibits are available to travel, and we continue to develop future traveling exhibits. Exhibits that tell stories to challenge and inspire the Anabaptist community today. To learn more and to bring one of our exhibits to your community, visit coffinmuseum.org. Thank you very much to Chuck, to Dave, to Karen, to Reinheld for telling their part in the Kaufman Museum story. Again, we're so glad that Tour Imagination has been able to do these virtual tours, and we hope sometime you'll be able to visit Central Kansas to see some of the things that we've talked about, or perhaps you'll want to talk to us about some of the exhibits that we have that travel. We have both the museum website and the museum email up on the screen. You're welcome to copy those down. Perhaps someone can put them in the chat also. And with that, we'd be happy to hear your stories or take your questions. We'll have everyone on the line tonight uh, that was a part of the program. So let us know what you think. <laughs>